of the talk here is to give a brief background on PFAS, highlighting some of the difficulties of them being in the environment and how we can go about actually containing them um, when they form plumes in the groundwater. And that will lead us to a brief background on what is plume self liquid hydrocarbon and how can that be used to address the PFAS issue, um, highlighting its ability to distribute and also looking at some of the absorptive potential for these compounds. And then at the end, I'll be excited to give you a brief uh, synopsis of some field data that we have for plume stops actually been used to treat PFAS. So this is not meant to be any kind of an intensive background, but you know, I think as we're learning with the PFAS compounds, um, it's a really complex mixture of chlorinated compounds, and I think we're practically learning every day that the list is growing longer as to what actually makes up the PFAS compounds. You know, we've heard the most about PFAS and PFO, they've garnered the most attention today. That's where our uh, studies also started, so that's where you're mostly here, although I will touch on some of the shorter chain, which is obviously something we talk a lot about at these kind of conferences. I, of course, I think it's pretty well established that these have been used in so many different products throughout the years, you know, from food containers all the way to the firefighting foams, and it's because of that they have ended up in the environment in such widespread um, places. Pretty much it seems like if you go look for, looking for them, you will probably find them. So, jumping in a little bit more into what these look like once they get into the groundwater, um, I'll highlight, highlight some data that AECOM presented on a couple of years ago at Mattel. Um, is that you know these tend to form very very large balloon plumes, um, typically can be over a mile in length. Sometimes it's hard to find the front of these plumes because they're so vast. Um, and then the other part of it is that they're usually at very low concentrations. There's maybe a source area that has some higher concentrations, but the majority of it will actually be in the low PPB levels. So that's just a difficult problem to start with. The first time you find something that's at low PPB levels, and then you know with the recent health advisory limit that was established at 70 parts per trillion for the combined PFO and PFOS. We're sorting at low concentrations and trying to get to lower concentrations. So it's just, it's, you know, by definition, not an easy problem. And then on top of that, they're very recalcitrant. It's hard to break these down. What we know and what works for other contaminants simply has not been as effective with these types of contaminants because of that very strong carbon fluorine bond. So again, just layer on an extra difficulty to the issue. And so right now, these, plum, these problems are very big, these plumes are already big, and so the best method we really have is to go to pump and treat. And typically, it's pump and treat coupled with the granular activity carbon type filters, although you know, other types of sorbents are being considered at this point as well. And so if you think about these two, or this whole summary of the slide together, we have really big plumes, and what we have to use right now is pump and treat systems. What that means is that there are going to be places within these plumes that just are simply not addressed right now. There are going to be some sensor receptors that are at risk, and actually more likely, they're probably already currently impacted. This could be, you know, bodies of water like we've shown here in this diagram, like a river. Other drinking water supplies, you know, these plumes are crossing on property boundaries. And so it brings to light that there could be use for an additional tool in our toolbox at this point to be able to use an in-situ barrier to protect these areas and really cut them off, um, perhaps in addition to pump and treat. And that's where plume self liquid activated carbon comes into play. Uh, this is a, and we're already using activated carbon in these exitue systems. This is still activated carbon, but it's in a different form that allows us to actually inject it into the aquifer. Um, and we can inject this under low pressures. It flows very similar to water in this case. And the reason why we can do that is because of the size of the activated carbon in plume stop. It's very small, on the order of one to two microns, which allows us to actually fit through the pore throats of the aquifer. Um, if it was any larger, we'd have a lot of issues actually getting it into the, into the aquifer at that point. And then it's further formulated with some polymers and other additives to keep it stable, keep it from agglomerating, which again allows it to actually distribute. And then from there, again, it is activated carbon, and so we as we know, activated carbon to do, it can absorb contaminants quickly, which is important for the idea of containing these plumes. If we remove it from the groundwater, they can no longer transport at this point. Um, you know, we've already been using plume stop for contaminants like chlorinated solvents and petroleum, and then again, we know activated carbon is used for PFAS, so this seems like a likely pairing of using them and this kind of a containment strategy. I want to point out this is not destroying these compounds by any means, but it is trying to prevent these problems from getting bigger in the meantime. 
and you know, maybe concentrating them in a more localized place before they actually get to be something much larger than they already are. So we'll talk about these two points uh, for starting off with the ability for this to actually be injected. This is really the key here, is that if you can't get it in the ground, it's not going to be effective. And so I think the first question to actually ask when we're thinking about getting plumes up into the ground is, well, where do we want to be putting it for it to actually contain these plumes? And so if we look at a, an illustration of a typical aquifer, most aquifers have some sort of heterogeneities. There would be higher permeability zones, and there's going to be lower permeability zones. The high perm zones are really where the freeways of the aquifer are. That's where the water is transporting. And so when we think about a contaminant or a contaminant plume getting larger, those contaminants are taking the freeways. That's how these plumes are going to be miles and miles long. And so it's really those zones that we want to target if we're thinking about containment. And so that's exactly where when we design plumes up, we're trying to find where those high perm zones are. And that's where we want to inject the plumes up, partly because that's where also where we're going to have the most success getting plumes up in. It's very hard to get any sort of transport through a clay, but we can get it into the same zones where the water is already moving through. Now let's take a look at what this actually looks like. Um, well, I guess first here's an example of actual core from the field, where you can see that quite readily. The, the permeable zones where it's gets stained black as opposed to the clays where water's not moving through there anyway. That's uh, not where we're putting the plumes up in, where we're going to be able to contain those plumes in those high perm zones. So taking a look at what it actually looks like for a plume stop to distribute, uh, this is a nice little column study that demonstrates the difference between plume stop and a commodity off-the-shelf powdered activated carbon. So these are gravity columns. Um, so when we open the tap at the bottom, you can see in this time lapse that powdered activated carbon is essentially just filtered out at the top. Whereas the formulation of plume stop allows it to actually distribute all the way through the column. Um, which again is key for us getting it into the ground. Now a question I always have here is, well, if plume stop moves readily, doesn't it just keep moving forever? How do you actually get it to stop? And it doesn't keep moving forever, that's the good part of this, is that it, it, um, it actually interacts with the soil and deposits a layer of the plume stop onto the soil. So a good way to think about it is like taking a paintbrush and dragging it along the wall. You leave a mark behind, but eventually the paint will run out. That's very similar to plume stop. Once you it interact with the soil, it'll leave the layer, but then it will eventually stop, so it does not move on forever. And to give you an idea of what that actually looks like, here's a standing electron microscopy image where there's a clean sand on the left and where plume stop has been deposited onto the sand um, in the right image. So you actually get that feel for it, adding a layer to the soil that's already there. But again, it actually interacts, and that's a permanent process. We can flush and flush, and it won't come off. So this uh, first column study is nice. It's a good demonstration, but also, admittedly, it's quite small. It's only about a foot or so long, which obviously is not a relevant distance in the field. So we wanted to look at this on a much larger scale. So we built a 16-foot column um, in our warehouse and filled that with a medium sand, and um, it's operated in up flow here, so there's a pump on the bottom. We actually pumped up the column and then collected everything coming out the other side. Uh, in total, we put five and a half core volumes of plume stop through this column. And the questions we were really trying to ask is, first of all, will it just even go 16 feet? And perhaps related to that question is, as we're continuing to pump plume stop through, is it going to ever start clogging? Um, will there be kind of pressure buildup? Will it change the flow? So. We went ahead and, and did this, started pumping the plumes out through, and it's a little bit hard to get a picture of the entire column, so it's easier to just kind of look at a couple of close-ups here. But you can see the, the column approaching the four-foot mark here, and then here, or the plumes up approaching the four-foot mark, and then here it's getting to about the 15-foot mark, and then it continued to go through, and we did see it a loop. So the first question was answered, it does travel 16 feet in this type of a column. Um, and then, Again, we continue to flush plume stop through with the idea of understanding will it start to clog. And while we were doing this, we actually collected the effluent samples and monitored the concentration of plume stop that was coming out so that we could get a breakthrough type curve here. So in this curve, you're looking at the relative concentration of the influent concentration <laughs> to the effluent. So when it's a value of one, that means what's coming out is the same as what's going in. And you can see that after about you know, 1.34 volumes or so is when we got the breakthrough of the plume stop. 
and then it approached and stayed at that one uh, value of one throughout the rest of the volume that we pumped through there, uh, which gave us an indication that we weren't seeing any kind of filtering effects. Um, we were able to actually pump it all the way through, and pressure was not built up throughout this process. Um, didn't see any kind of change in the flow. So this gave us a good indication that you know we were able to pump through a system like this. And in fact, if we had been able to build an even longer column, we would expect that we'd be able to pump it all the way through um, something much longer in this case. Now the final example of transport, and I'm really kind of giving you a couple examples here because this really is the key. If we can't get it into the ground, obviously it's not going to be effective at containing these plumes. So the final example here is a dual porosity tank test. So this gets a little bit to more field relevant conditions because most um, fields, again, are not a simple column that's all sand. We have more heterogeneities there. So the, um, hopefully you can see in this column, or in this picture here, these tanks have these different stripes going through them. So these are actually alternating layers of high and low permeability soils. These are about three feet long and we operated them from bottom to top. So the low perm soils are a silt, and those are actually the lighter colored stripes in the tanks. And the high perm soil is the sand with some sandy loam mixed into it, and those are the darker colored stripes in the tanks. And so the effects of uh, putting plume stop in were basically injecting plume stop and then continuing to flush with water after that initial injection of plume stop. And the results are, are quite visual here. So you can see early on, we basically just have put about one four volume of plume stop through. You can see the plume stop is taking those high firm channels, as you would expect, because that's where the water is also flowing through these tanks. But then as we continue to flush water through, the plume stop actually continued to move for a little while. And you can see that you have full coloration of those high firm zones. But then there's actually some penetration happening into those low firm soils as well, which actually wasn't as much as we were really expecting. You can actually get a better, I think, feel for it if you take these, look at these pictures um, when the glass is taken off, so we don't have that glare there. But, um, so it's these channels here are the low perm zones, are basically completely black in that case. And um, the implications of this are, we get better contact with contaminants if they're in those low perm zones, but I'd say more so it just demonstrates the ability for the for plume stuff to actually transport um, not just through sand, but also into some lower permeable soils, so that we know we can really get this in to the ground and have contact with the contaminants in this case. So we can we can transport it, we can inject it. Now the question is, well, what? How is it going to perform? How is it going to work with contaminants like PFAS? So for any contaminant that we look at with plume stuff, we always measure isotherms to understand the dose response that can be. Um, that is between plume stop and the given contaminant, because every contaminant is different. That's true of any activated carbon. So we've done that with uh, PFOS and PFO, and we're continuing to gain more information for a wider um, number of these compounds. And unless we were looking at isotherms on a daily basis, these don't necessarily mean a whole lot. And so part of the question, especially for a talk like this, is how else can we be interpreting isotherms like this? And so we started to look at ways that we can integrate plume stop into fate and transport models as a tool, really, to use these isotherms that we can measure to understand that dose response and then predict what the longevity of a plume is, or a plume stop dose is going to be, and then ideally be able to tune that for, to be able to meet the goals of a certain site. How long do we need to be capturing this for? And so, if you were at the talk earlier by my colleague Jeremy first, let's we'll talk a little bit more on the recent developments. This was some early work we did on this. We actually collaborated with uh, Professor Arturo Keller at the University of California, Santa Barbara, to incorporate a plume stop dose into the existing biofilm model. And so, we can actually look at an example of this um, to get an idea of what a plume stop dose might look like. So, in this case, we'll just run through a quick scenario of a a plume that's moving, let's look at a five part per billion plume of PFOA, moving at a seepage velocity of 120 feet per day. We'll model it over the course of 70 years, and we'll see how far that plume is expected to have moved. And then we'll compare that to adding in a plume stop barrier into the, into the model. That barrier would be located right here, and then we can monitor what's coming out 
of that barrier over the same course, uh, the same time frame, and see what that looks like. So the output is, here's a truncated graph here. Basically, in that time frame of the model, we'd expect the pupil of them to expand over a mile over the course of 70 years under these types of conditions. As opposed to when there's a flip-flop barrier himself, we're going to have containment of that plume for that same kind of time frame. Um, it'll, it can actually cut off that plume and prevent it from moving in that time. Of course, this is the theoretical um, time frame as a model, um, and it's based on a single component. So it's important to consider what other factors are going to uh, impact that longevity. And really, a lot of it has to do with mass flux. We obviously have an amount of plume stop in the ground, which has a certain capacity, and so the time that it's going to uh, last, how long it's before you see breakthrough, is going to really determine or be determined by how much mass flux is coming through that system. And so you can imagine if the seepage velocity was faster, that time would decrease. If it was a little bit slower, it would actually increase. Um, but the concentration of the contaminants present will obviously dictate how long that will last. Um, and then also the contaminants present. I mean, that, the scenario I showed you was for PFO only plume. Obviously, we know that that's a very unlikely case, so there's going to be usually multiple components there. As you continue to add more and more components, those will all have a demand on the sorption sites, and so that's going to impact your longevity as well. And then similar, other organic species. Um, this could be dissolved organ organic matter, it could be other contaminants that aren't regulated. Um, these will still um, be absorbed by the plume stop. There's no way to preferentially decide who's going to absorb there or not. And so this is really important, and something we take into account when we're designing sites is to basically know all of this so that we know what that total demand is and so that we can account for all of it in order to determine what the longevity is going to actually be. And of course, we can always alter the plume stop dose to something higher or lower to try and account for that and gain the desired longevity. Perhaps it's also a series of barriers that's going to be needed in order to meet the objectives. So just real briefly, another way of describing everything that I showed you is that, in a sense, what we're able to do by injecting plume stop into the ground is really engineer the retardation factor for the contaminants moving. You know, obviously a higher retardation factor means the contaminants are moving slower through the groundwater. And so just as a general kind of conclusion or note on this um, really to absorb is that typical retardation factors for P4 and PFOS with natural FOC um, are typically in the range of something like 3 to 20 based on some literature values. And it's um, very reasonable to believe that you can increase those retardation factors by orders of magnitude by a you know, fairly modest application of plume stop. Again, depending on all those other factors with the, the velocity is, I'm just going to determine what it really looks like for your site though. And then just a brief comment here on um, the performance of plume stop for shorter than <coughs> PFAS compounds. Um, but the quick conclusion here is that if you are aware of what happens with shorter chain uh, compounds with activated carbon, it's a very similar trend, or it is the same trend for plume stop. There's nothing really different here. And so what we did want to set up to test this, um, in a batch sorption test, we looked at the C8 change, so people and PFAS, and also looked at a C6 and a C4 chain as well. And the results are shown here. So again, this is a simple batch test. Here's the controller, you know, about 100 ppb to start. Um, and then in each case, you know, with a plume stop treatment, um, we're able to reduce those concentrations through sorption. And the trend is what has been observed for other activated carbons. PFOS um, absorbs the best or the strongest, and then followed by PFOA, and then it decreases with shorter chains. And so that is the exact same trend that we have seen here. And the implications of this is that if you know a C4 perfluorobutane sulfonic acid is um, present in a plume, it is going to be the first thing to break through. It does not absorb extremely strongly. Um, and so that's, there's nothing different here. However, I'd say the key fact is that there is at least some absorption capacity there. So there can be some containment that happens. But if you wanted to make sure you're containing everything, you'd have to be very conservative in how you're designing this and perhaps use the, the shorter chains as your monitoring point or you know, just to determine the dose is what you'd actually use in this case. And so I'll wrap up here with a, a brief overview of a case study 
Um, this is a site in Canada. Um, it was a relatively shallow site and it still some sand. And the historical use of this site was that there was a hydrocarbon spill, um, but also at some point it was believed that there was some kind of firefight firefighting training that happened there as well. And so what that means for the site is that there was baseline concentrations of um, PFAS and PFOA as well as BTEX and TPH. So this was a commingled plume. And I'll note that there were not other PFAS compounds analyzed for, it was just PFAS and PFOA, so this is all the, the data I have on this part. Um, but you can see the concentrations range from a fraction of a PPB up to about 3 PPB for the PFAS and PFOA and then low levels of VTEX, and up to about 6 ppm of TPH. And this is a schematic of the site, and I've only shown the PFOS and PFOA concentrations here for simplicity. So basically, down here is basically where that source would have been, and the groundwater is flowing this way, so we have a plume of PFOA and PFOS moving off site. And then of course there's the, the TPH and VTEX there as well. And so at the site, uh, plume stop was used as remedial technology, and it was applied through that same zone as well as up here because of the hydrocarbon concentrations were up in that area. Uh, but the results of this were that all the compounds present went to not detect, and that was observed in the first monitoring event, which was about three months after application, and then this has sustained through the most recent monitoring event, which was in May of this year. So it's been almost 15 months of uh, sustained non detect. So this is a nice demonstration of you know, plume stop being used to remove these contaminants from the groundwater and then uh, the implication is that it's going to prevent them from further spreading. Um, and then I think an extra point is that you know, we were able to capture the PFAS and PFOA in the presence of other concentrations that were at higher concentrations to begin with. So um, we'll continue to monitor the site and we'll see how um, it performs over the longer term. So some of the take home messages here too is thinking about the way that plume stop can be used to manage PFAS plumes. It's really about that ability to inject activated carbon into the subsurface. Again, we can do this at low pressures and at wide centers so that we can coat the subsurface with activated carbon to remove these contaminants from the aqueous phase to prevent them from continuing to spread. And you know, this is basically a way of a passive plume control. Once you inject the plume stop, the groundwater will continue to flow naturally and capture these without you know, adding in a, a new pump and treat system. So avoiding some of those costs, perhaps it could be coupled with something to you know, decrease the demand on those pump and treat systems as well. And then the you know, kind of optimistic viewpoint here is that you know, we've been successful in coupling plume stop with uh, four other contaminants that can degrade um, you know, with enhanced uh, bioremediation tech technologies to trap them and then further degrade them. And so you know, I think with the, all the work that's being done currently to try and find technologies to actually destroy these, this could be something we could couple down the road. We can be concentrating these contaminants in a certain area and then go back and couple it with any kind of technologies that are being developed hopefully right now um, to actually destroy these types of contaminants. So with that, um, I think there's a minute here for questions. Yeah.